everyone. Uh, my name's Martin Price. Um, I'm between you and the raffle. Um, and I've heard that's... <laughs> and, and I've heard that's why <laughs> everyone's still here, so that's awesome. Um, and I hope everyone's had a great day. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little today about rapid prototyping and product innovation. Um, I've been doing product stuff for about 14 years. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples and just some stuff I've learned. Um, if there's anything anyone would like to go deeper into, give me a shout. There's some friendly faces of folks I know in the room. So if anyone wants to call me out on my memory as well, they're more than welcome. Um, but yeah, so first off, I wanted to get just a sense of who's in the room. So I, my sense is everyone's in product, correct? OK, so who's, who's uh, in product at a startup right now? A couple? Who's, <laughs> I, what's the, I go, I'm not going to do the stage. So I'm at a Series E startup, post-Series E, so that's not really a startup, <laughs> in my view. Um, but so startups, we had a few. Um, I would say large companies, so like 500 plus. All right, cool. All right. So I don't have many models or matrices. So that, may, that may fox some of you guys. Only joking. OK, so. Um, Let's get into it. So quick summary of me. That's me when I had slightly more hair. Um, I'm currently a senior director of mobile products at OpenX. Um, um, you guys know what OpenX does. Leader in ad tech based in Pasadena, about 320 people. Um, post Series E, as I mentioned. Um, Samsung led the last round. Um, and real innovator in the ad tech space. So I'll talk a little bit later about OpenX. But first off, I want to talk about more fun stuff and product. Um, so before that, I was at Yahoo for a long time, um, London, obviously, in Sunnyvale. And um, I also worked a bunch of these companies. Um, Produxy was a company I founded um, that, was based, that was built around helping uh, companies innovate faster. Um, I'll tell you, give you some examples and some stuff we learned from doing that, which was kind of fun. Um, Geodelic, um, where I worked with Jeff, among stuff, which was a venture-backed startup. IC, where I built their local ads platform, and I did consulting at Vodafone and Nokia. So um, I also do kind of talks around mobile. Um, I, re I was at Mobile World Congress on Tuesday talking at the App Developers Alliance, um, and we're doing a bunch of things there. Um, so if anyone wants to quiz me on anything around just mobile, mobile industry, what's going on, love to go deeper. So some wins kind of in, in the things I've done. Um, and I'll show you some examples of a few of these, because I thought that might be easier than just explaining. Um, so some of the stuff I did at Yahoo, I led a uh, homepage rollout in 24 markets in, we actually launched simultaneously in 24 markets, which I don't know if any people have ever tried to do that, but it's a complete nightmare. <laughs> um, and I can detail the levels of nightmare that, that were created, if, if it's useful for anyone. Um, so that was launching yahoo.com. We did some cool stuff around Toolbar, which I talk about. And then I was in the ad tech space originally in London. So I built a team that built the first kind of rich media ads into Yahoo in uh, the UK, uh, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy um, for a number of years. And it's funny because, um, yeah, never, you know, never burn your bridges with folks you don't think you're going to be working with again. Because <laughs> being back in the ad tech space, it's funny how many of them are still around. So that's good. Um, Productsy, we actually we managed to grow um, a product innovation-based startup. So what we did was we worked, we built um, a set of APIs that people build products on top of, and we worked with companies to build their kind of first version product, and we were able to scale that, scale that within a year to a million in revenue with no funding whatsoever. Um, so that was an interesting win. Unfortunately, we weren't able to quite scale the business in the way we'd hoped, but we were able to help companies with um, the MVP process, like how to get an initial test app out to market, get it in the app store, get it through test flight to get feedback. Um, and you know, we had some cool products that we work with there. Um, I mentioned the IEC, and then OpenX, I'll show you a little bit later, but in, within six months, we've been able to launch a whole range of products at OpenX, and this week, we launched the first native ads exchange for mobile, um, which is what we're doing in Barcelona, officially, uh, not eating tapas and drinking. And um, I can tell you a little bit more about that. But first off, um, I just wanted to share some learns from that background and things that worked. And just some suggestions for you guys. As you're in product, you're mostly at big companies. I think the thing I've noticed going back to a, what I would call a big company, which is 320 people at the moment, is 
Um, at a startup, you learn, you learn a lot faster and you do a lot more, and bringing that to a big company helps you a great deal. And that kind of spirit um, really is valuable at a larger company. So, so just some tips and uh, things I recommend is even if you're a product manager on the least important product um, at a huge portfolio company, just start to think a little bit different, right? You may have a, a backlog which has a ton of features that are very incremental. Um, we used to call it Yahoo squeezing kind of more juice from the lemon, right? We used to do you know, hundreds of multivariate tests of how if we made the outside of the search box slightly more bold, we would get an extra one or 2% um, you know, uh, searches, which admittedly was a shit ton of revenue at that time, but it wasn't uh, the most, sorry? That's a tech, yeah, yeah, you, I'll make a note of it. I can show you more details. We have a spec for that. Um, and so, yeah, so we, and we, but it's not the most interesting thing as a product manager to work through, right? Like you're literally looking at, you know, an analysis of 20 different shadings and the various reports of that, right? And uh, that can be very demotivating and, 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 you know, just as a product person, you're like, I thought I was building the future and no, I'm kind of optimizing the border, right? So, so that's something we, we don't think we really want to do. So, but there's ways you can get around that. And so what I would say is just even if it's in your, no one really has 20% time, I think that's a myth, but if you have like 1% time, try and think a little bit further out, right? So try and think three, six, nine months out. And think, you know, the nice thing, the thing I love about product management is you get to see the, if you do it really well and, and you've got, you're at a good company, you'll get to see the whole sphere of the company, right? You get to interact from everyone from, legal to you know HR to very deep with development to the business side the sales to all the different functions and that gives you per, you know a perspective that only really the executive team have apart from you right so with that perception you can then say right if, if we did a little more in this area we could actually make a sizable difference to our business and the fun thing is you've got a you're a bit closer to actually getting that done than they are Right? They can say, yes, we have to do this. But by the time they've thought of that, they've got a ton of other stuff to do. You can actually have had a developer working with you on it. You could come up with a prototype of it. You could have created something that shows that that's the direction your company should go. And then there's no reason um, any of us can't do that tomorrow. Another lesson I learned is actually from a friend of mine who now runs a huge team at Adobe. Um, and work, I work closely with at Yahoo is, you don't have to come up with the best idea. Now, I'm going to, in typical product fashion, contradict myself in about two slides by saying you should create ideas, but you don't have to, right? So if you're working, like, a tool, like on one of the projects I worked on, we got our patents for, and we had a huge success with, I was a huge, like, large revenue, what is it, shit ton? <laughs> shit ton of revenue, uh, product lines, 300 million. We had uh, 60 people working on this product, and you know, some of the guys, they had awesome ideas, but they weren't being heard, right? The best ideas that came out of that team were actually um, developers who weren't even in the, they weren't in San Vail. There were actually two guys we had out of Atlanta who, you know, were just really awesome at what they did and had some really, um, had some really interesting ideas, but there wasn't a process for them to get those out apart from me in that, in that role as a product manager. Right? So if you're in that situation, never kind of ignore what people are saying to you. Try and learn as much as possible and spend time with people because that you don't have to have the idea. You just need to be able to look at it analytically and say that's what we should do. Or at least let's test that idea and test that hypothesis. Um, and in order to do that, you need to build great cross-functional relationships. And I think other folks here have talked about that, so I won't go too deep. Um, and one of my favorite things, and we're doing this a lot at the moment in, in my new team, is we're giving really hard stuff, and stuff I can, I can quantify in more detail for, for the analysts amongst us, but um, we're giving, if we think we've got an opportunity somewhere, we're giving it to a developer straight away, right? The previous way you used to do product management is you, your company has an idea, they'll assign a product manager to it, that product manager will go do a bunch of analysis, um, and you can still do that, and I, I would still recommend some strategies around doing that, and I've done a lot of that myself. We found it works a lot faster, and we can learn a lot more to actually give a problem to a developer, you know, with, a, with some sort of structure, and just have them run with it, alongside doing that strategy process, alongside contacting people in the space, talking to companies who are doing similar things. What it, what it helps with is, one, 
you've got two people who now understand the problem, right? So before it's one, and then you have to go off and kind of sell internally, you know, how we could potentially solve a problem. The other, the other uh, thing that that creates is someone who can actually potentially solve the problem, <laughs> right? Because it, depending, unless you're a product manager who also codes, and if you are, good on your engineering team, but <laughs> they may not let you do that forever. Um, you, by creating those two people then trying to hack and find the quickest way to solve that problem, you're creating a little bit of competition and you're creating a more dynamic work environment. And you've got shared understanding, which is really critical. And the other thing I would say, and I, I've made this a little bit wordy, but think really big and then reduce down, right? So we've done, I've done this both ways and failed with the, the ladder and <laughs> doing the ladder first. And I wanted to share that with you guys. And it's just, what I mean by that is, if you're, what we tend to do now with Lean Startup is say, hey, we, we're thinking of testing a product that is X, or we're thinking of building a feature that does Y. And then we say, what's the MVP of that product? So we take like a good half the functionality out, and we say, oh, if we could just prove this, it kind of shows that you know, there's some interest there and, and we could build this. Or we think there's some money to be made there, or we think customers will like that but you haven't really thought through the whole thing. What is best to do, if you can, and with some development and, and with some testing, is think big and then reduce down. Um, and we've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of projects fail or products not work in the market because they just went too narrow too quickly. Okay? And obviously, test always, um, but to my kind of point about the borders, like just kind of iterating on very tiny features, it's not innovation. Right, it's product management, it's a very important part. It's improving your product, improving your conversion rate, pushing more people down the funnel, it's all good. But it's not doing something new, right? Innovation is you're, you're pushing into new categories, you're driving your business forward in a new and more interesting way. Okay, useful? I got at least three knots. Okay, so now I'm gonna contradict myself <laughs> a little, but say this is something I've noticed uh, at least recently um, with product folks I've worked with, they're not building stuff. And by stuff, I don't mean, you know, you, you're going to you know, build an enterprise-grade software application for thousands of businesses, you know, just in your spare time, right, in between meetings. But what I mean is, you, you as a product person, with all that information that you're getting and all of the, the kind of role that you have in the company, especially most of you guys are a larger company, you can be building and, and creating new things all the time. So, you know, those could be designs, those could be concepts, those could be wireframes, you could be using Envision to do some uh, basic kind of click-through prototyping, you could be using Balsamic to just get an idea across of something new you could do. Um, but I would try and build something. So, I used, to be, I used to write code at Yahoo and some people liked it. Um, I mean, we shipped, you know, it was running on the homepage of six, at least six of the countries in Europe um, at most days. Right? Philo didn't like it, he, he had it recoded when I sent it to him. But, you know, I learned a lot about having to build and structure and, and, and um, being able to just be able to have the, those conversations, understand what you're good at and what you're, you know, what you're able to do on a technical side also gives you a bit more respect in the team, right? So being able to know that, yes, you may not be the best coder, but you know how, you know, generally kind of back and front end um, infrastructure, like, in app development, you know, knowing how APIs are going to be structured and versioned so you can um, build more interesting things on top of them. It's very important um, to be able to lead a product team which involves a lot of technical people, right? So I, the last few sessions I gave were a little more strategic and a little more on product strategy. But for me, you can get a lot more done if your engineering team really like working with you. And a good way to do that is hack something up and just show it to them and be part of the demo at the end of the sprint. Right? They may laugh and they may say, you know, I could have done that in a couple of hours for you, but they would appreciate that you've tried and, and you're at least p kind of part of the solution versus part of the problem. And while doing that, you get the opportunity to just show it to as many people as possible. So, you know, something I like to do is just like create anything, it can be mock-ups, can be just slides, just take it around the company, right? Just don't go to a few meetings and just walk around and show it to people get their feedback. If they say they hate it, it confuses them, they don't see the point, great. Annoying, but great. Right? The more feedback, the better. And you don't, 
I see a lot of people, and I've worked with a lot of people that don't feel that they can do that on their own. And I think that's completely wrong. Oh, and my favorite example of this, um, so we did this uh, um, at Produxy. So we, we went to Disrupt, and we built some stuff, and we're kind of announcing the company. And we had the booth in the Startup Alley. Any of you guys been to Disrupt, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> You saw me there. Um, but yeah, so we, um, we set up a booth, and you know, I was feeling good. Oh, right, we're at Disrupt, and we got the product, and loads of people come around. What do you do? And we're pitching. It's like, great. And then there was a booth next to us, and it was pretty busy. And, and they're getting lots of traffic, and, and um, the entrepreneur, we had, we, you know, we were both completely tired because there's nowhere to sit, and you have to pay extra for a chair. Very strange. <laughs> Seriously. But yeah, and trash can. But yeah, so we, we went on the side and we both went out like, you guys are doing great. Like, what, what does your product do? How, how does it work? And he's like, well, and he had these great signs like this, but like full color. And he was getting kind of sign-ups for his new product. And, and I was like, well, you know, like, it's an HTML platform for um, building apps on top of it. But it's, you know, it'll, you know, speed up your mobile web design by 100 times. And he had some just basic pitch stuff. He had a kind of email sign-up and some screenshots. And I was like, yeah, it looks great. You know, we do a lot of mobile web stuff as well. I'm interested to know how it works. And he takes me aside and he tells me a bit about background. And um, we were building products. We were based at Clearstone down in Santa Monica. We were very nice to us, gave us some office space and helped us get off the ground, which we're forever appreciative for. And, you know, we knew similar investors. And he'd had a company and sold a couple of companies that they'd been involved in. And I was like, this is great. Look, just give me a demo. I want to use this product. He's like, I can't. I was like, what? There's no product. I was like, well, there must be, you know, it's disrupt and you know, you've got to have a demo and you're signing up like your line of people at your booth. And he was like, well, no, but I want to get feedback. So I've created this fake product. I've hired a couple of people that I know just to help out. And everyone who comes to my booth, I'm asking them what would they want, would want this platform to do, right? And he's making notes and he's jotting down on his iPad and he's getting all the feedback that he needs to build that product. He knows the area he wants to build the product in, but he doesn't want to waste all that money and time to, to build that product in advance and then take it to market like I did, thinking that's what you do, which I don't think was unreasonable, to be honest. But, you know, I, it was an MVP. It was like, we only spent six months on it. But he'd spent, you know, much less time. He'd learned lots more. And at the end of the conference, he had, you know, couple of hundred potential customers and had the ability to build it because he obviously built companies and built companies in the tech space before and able to execute it. And so for me, like I felt he won that conference. Right. And you know, most of the folks in that startup alley, you know, it's changed this every year and I've been back and you know, they're, they're not the same companies, but I think they spent a lot of money and they wasted a lot of that money and he didn't. Right? He just went and learned the maximum amount, the shortest possible time. And there's no reason why you can't do that in your own company at all. Absolutely none. But yeah. Comments, questions, hate me? Um, I don't know, actually. I'll, I'll send him a note. WhatsApp? No, 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 it wasn't there. Uh, so, I mean, here's some stuff that kind of I've done. Again, it's more tips and tricks and, and just some examples. So, you know, things that are along these lines of rapid prototyping and testing. I wanted to show a couple of examples. Um, it's a little thin, but you see these toolbars at the top of the page that are just running along. So um, when we're doing the toolbar project, I mentioned we have 50 engineers, a ton of money, blah, blah, blah. One of the problems we had was testing a new toolbar was a huge problem, right? We had, you know, you had to test against every uh, software application. Um, it was just a, like a, we had deals with OEMs, which was like a three to six month test cycle. Very hard to innovate a product when you know you can't ship it for a year, right? Very, very hard. Like just the cycle of release was that long. And they all had a say, right? But we knew, so at the time, um, IE was building um, functionality to close toolbars and hide toolbars, which was arguably a good idea, right? Because users didn't like them and they found them annoying. But shit ton of ribbon. So what do you do as a product manager on that product? It was a very interesting space to be in. And what we did was we knew we had to build in more user functionality, but we knew we didn't have enough time to do it before you know, the browser upgrades and we're working closely with Microsoft started coming out. So what we did was we just used HTML and JavaScript and built a toolbar that sat in the top of a browser and looked exactly like an existing toolbar. 
And then we ran out some machines and we invited, um, it was about uh, 20 people a day to come in and play with it. And we had a developer and myself and a designer and we all sat behind the screen and we watched how people played with it. And after, every, uh, after each session, we changed it. It's a methodology, methodology called Write, Rapid Iteration, Testing and Evaluation. And I mean, this was a while ago, this was 2007, 2008, but we were able to learn a lot through that process. And I still don't see that many companies using that today. Certainly when I came to LA a few years ago, I was expecting this was commonplace and people would have labs and be doing lots of testing or now you can put stuff out and use the testing.com. A lot of companies weren't doing that and it's very strange because we learned so much in that session. We, had, we now have multiple UI patterns granted for this uh, product, the product shipped. You know, it didn't save the toolbar, but it kept um, the market share for a long period after as a result. And, it, and some of the stuff we came up with, like little applications, you see that weather application? Looks pretty similar to something on your phone, right? And that's something we built before the iPhone came out. And again, linked to this idea that we could pull all this information together. Um, something similar we did um, at Geodelic, which I really like, which is down here, is we were working with small businesses and trying to give them a loyalty. Um, we, were working, we built a deal solution and we're trying to, what, when we talked to the business owners, they said, well, you know, the deals thing is great and Groupon and la la, but I really just want repeat customers, right? Which isn't crazy. I think most of us would sympathize with that, that you want real traffic. You don't want to pop, you know, and no one, they never come back. Um, so one of the cool things we did and that I really enjoyed was we actually built an app with no back end at all. We basically built a dummy app. It's very similar to a clickable prototype, but obviously ran on the device. And we took it out on the iPad and we took it into small businesses and we sat with them. We showed them how it worked. And this is how when users come in, they check in and put their email in and they get points for that. And this is how, the, and then you send them emails and say, hey, if you come back another two, three times, we'll, we'll give you... Um, well, we'd show it on the screen as well and say um, how close you were to getting a reward and kind of drive that loyalty to those businesses back. And we're able to do that with very little development effort, right? It was very light. It was a prototype, right? It had, it had no real back end. It had no real APIs or infrastructure behind it. But we're able to get multiple businesses to give us the feedback and then we're able to build out and put it in stores. So that whole process of kind of analysis and market and you know, what are my competitors doing? And there were people in the space, right? Like, there was a lot of people getting venture funding for this. Um, Belly, I think, is still in the space and still going strong. Um, but we knew we had something, but we just wanted to get it out. We just wanted to learn the maximum we could. And we were able to do that by just building stuff, right? Um, and the example on the right, uh, my company, Produxy, what we did was we did this for mobile apps. Right? We did a little bit of mobile web stuff, but we mostly did it for mobile apps. And a similar process, six to eight weeks, we would have something in your hand that was running, either through test flight or ideally in the stores, from a concept. So literally, the app on the right, there's an app called Glimmer. It's very similar to Burst or um, now the Flippergram and, and these apps that are very kind of about sharing a sequence of images and some audio and some filters together. So it's very ahead of its time. It's a couple of folks from Google. We really like working with them. And, but they literally, we had a whiteboard, we drew something out, and then six weeks later we had something that they could share with 100 people. Right? Very fast uh, design and iteration process, very product-led, no PRD. No PRD. Right? Building stuff, creating stuff, hacking stuff. Still, product is key to that and driving that and making that process work, but you don't need even a one-page document necessarily to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, and then some kind of more teamy stuff. Um, one of the things, like especially for folks in the bigger companies that I learned, and I wanted to pitch a little bit startups and bigger companies. And the bigger companies, that stuff actually can be hard, right? I, I, it's funny because when there's four of you in a room, and you can build stuff like that really quickly, when there's four of you in a room, but you're in a building of 200, it seems to slow down, right? And one of the reasons it slows down, um, and I think one of the biggest things here is, like, you've got to be the driver still, but you're often in, you know, meetings, you've got cross-functional teams, you've got um, matrix organizations. None of that is conducive to actually innovating and building product, in my view, 
Anyone disagree with that? Just have interest? One. <laughs> Fair point. OK. We'll, we'll do that Q&A. <laughs> um, really? Anyway. Um, so, um, so one of the one of the first things I did in my my current role and one, and one of the the things I did in the past is always reduce the approval process you have, right? So if you come in, product manager, let's say you get a project, let's say you make it interesting because you find a new avenue to pursue. One of the first things you need to do is say, right, I'm going to, I need. You go to your boss, you go to your boss's boss, you go to the CEO, and you say, right, I need a quicker approval process for this, right? This is really key. I've seen this work a, l a huge amount of times. At Yahoo, we're able to stem Google. Google was going to overtake us three years before they actually did because of innovations. We're able to push the home page because my boss at the time went to Jeff Weiner at the time and said, look, I need to talk to one person. I can't talk to 500 people in this organization. Now, I'm not saying we, everything we did was perfect, but by being able to have a much faster approval route, we were able to do more stuff faster. We were able to test more things. We were able to build more things quicker. And it's exactly the reason why startups also are able to focus more and, and build things quicker. So one thing I would always advise you is try and find a way around that. Now, it can be official. That can be unofficial. That could be like, there's a lot of stuff we do now that we just push out. We don't tell anyone because it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. right? And if your team's on board, if you've built really good relationships with your team and you're working really closely and you're building and you're hacking all together as a team, they're going to follow you if they, if they believe in it, which basically validates your idea to a large extent. Right? So that's something I, I would really recommend. And something I know it's hard, I know it's tricky, but just try and do it as much as you can. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, I think that's mostly what I wanted to get across. Any questions on any of that so far? Quick one. Uh, text edit? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> we, so yeah, I mean, I mentioned Envision. I mentioned Balsamic. Um, I, I, I mean, Envision's being used a lot. We used, I think Envision's probably the best tool right now that, that's being used the most for just kind of building, you know, a v what looks like a real product and showing it to people. Um, but I would actually build, if you can, build something real. Build something that'll run in a browser or run in a device. You're not going to get the same results. You know, it's quicker and cheaper to do Envision and then try and show it, or some screenshots and try and show it on a device. Like, so mostly I've, I do mobile, right? So the last five years have been mostly focused on mobile. If you test something in a browser, full desktop browser, and then think it's going to work on mobile, it's never going to work. Right? We have lots of projects like that where you think, oh, yeah, we've got this lovely UI, and then you actually see it on the device, and it sucks. Right? Like, so those are a couple of tools I would suggest, but I would try and build something. I would try and build a dummy app. I would try and build a, you know, e even a HTML5 prototype versus just showing images where possible, but I would at least have the images. Um, and I would try and do something that looks a little more like a product. So typically, a lot of product managers use Balsamic. I love Balsamic. They're great guys. But I think you'll get further and you'll get more attention by trying to do something a little high, higher fidelity, something that really looks like a user can interact with it, and then get, try and get that feedback. Does that? OK. OK, so I want to talk a little about product strategy, but I'll probably whiz through this. So a, a bunch of other people talked about product strategy and different methodologies, and there's a load of things you can do. So basically, you do market and positioning. You look at competitors. You look at opportunities and threats. You do some product analysis. I reckon you can do this in about a week, honestly. Um, anyone else do this in about a week? Mm. Yes, good on you. <laughs> um, really, like I've seen, kind of lots of different processes and different method methodologies for doing this, and you know I think that people do that awesome and probably way more detailed. But if you can combine a quick, very quick and thorough process, combined with some hacking and some actual learning, I think you'll you'll go a lot further with building the right product. That's my kind of hint. To tip on strategy. And then you iterate it. In the same way you iterate a product, you iterate the strategy. So you, sh you share it with as many people, like a business plan. You don't, like, 
you, 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 <laughs> the old model was you don't tell people your business plan, <laughs> right? H having, you know, spent a, f a couple of years in the kind of VC space um, with kind of companies and then just being in the office a lot, like that doesn't get you far. Like not many people come in and just don't share the business plan and get a ton of money, right? That just doesn't happen. And also like people handing out NDAs typically went badly as well, right? So, and the more people you share it with, the better the feedback. Think of the guy at Disrupt, right? He got all the feedback he needed and more, right? So, and he did it by just sharing, being open, and actually changing his pitch through the day. And very similar to the right testing, right? He was changing the pitch through the day. He wasn't changing the images. I would have gone a little bit further and <laughs> tried to do that. But he literally was just, you know, he was adapting what the, the product did based on what, it, what he was hearing from everyone, right? Because then he could validate and get deeper and, and learn more. And so even if you're doing product strategy and even if you're kind of, you, you know, you're thinking of doing this on a portfolio model, I would try and keep it an iterative process, is my suggestion. And do a very quick, you know, um, revenue analysis. The big thing here is work out the potential risk and time to market. Um, because that's the thing. So basically the idea is it's what the money can be made minus cost of in, internal resources, but the risk in terms of the time to market is kind of key. Right? And we, we spend a lot of time, um, uh, our current company at OpenX, thinking about like, how, what is that cost of waiting right? versus just going out. And I wanted to give you a couple of examples of that to wrap up. So a quick bit about what we're doing at OpenX. So I run a mobile product. We're a startup within a startup, and we're pretty well funded. Right? I mentioned like 320 people. We've got about 20 to 30 people working on mobile. Um, I'm going to show you a little video. It shows what we've done in the last six months only. Um, and we create everything we're doing. And we're doing that on the product marketing side because we learned from the disrupt guy. We're putting out things a little ahead of where we are. And we're learning the feedback we get. And we're iterating those um, along with them. And this week, we la launched in Barcelona the first uh, private exchange um, for native. And we did that again by building stuff very fast and getting feedback. We went out to New York. We talked to everyone in the market on a both a publisher and a DSP side who might be interested in this. And then we quickly iterated and built the first version. And then we kind of grew it up a level and plugged everyone in together. And you'd think ad tech scale, like huge industry, lots of different players, you wouldn't be able to do that, but you can. And so Flip side on consumer, you, like, people assume you can do that, but you can do that in the enterprise as well. That's my high level point. It's not something that's, you can't, you, it's not that you can only do rapid prototyping for consumer products. It's possible in the enterprise. It's just, you have to be, to be honest, you have to really go out there and spend a lot of time with your customers, but you can use the same processes um, if you're testing with users. And let's see if the video works.
Any questions? No? Oh, sure. Yeah, so the, so the question was, are there any HTML5 development platforms you can do to build your prototype, or you can use to build it faster? So th there's a whole bunch. Um, to be honest, I, <laughs> we usually build ours, um, ourselves. I mean, you, there's a lot of frameworks you can use. Um, uh, Censure, um, you can use, I mean, a lot of people build stuff just direct on top of Backbone.js. If you're kind of, are you technical, non-technical? Yeah, so I, I would look at, um, I would look at, we, we built some stuff on Censure that we like. There's um, another one, folks in the room may know, which I can't remember the main competitor to them. Um, sorry? Yeah. Oh, I can't hear you. Ken do you why? Yeah, I can't remember. There was one, there was one other, um, but I'll, I'll look it up for you in a second. Yep. And I think most of the kind of Creative Suite tools are pretty optimized for exporting to HTML5 now. But yeah. Sorry? Ratchet? Oh, right, cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Hey. Uh, that's an interesting question, right? So, so to repeat the question um, for these guys, <laughs> um, you're at the stage where you've built a social networking app for iOS. It's about 75% of kind of where you want it to be. 50 to 60. Okay. It's fully, it looks nice. Okay. But you're not, you're not sure whether to put it in the store and kind of, or wait and kind of get more. Yeah, because the benefits of putting it in the store is I can kind of more yeah. feedback. And right now it's really difficult to get feedback. Okay, so. My question would be, <laughs> kind of what have you done to get Phoebus? You've got it in test flight. Have you got 100 users testing it? No. It's okay. actually kind of different. It's a niche market, so I have to get specific users. OK. You've got a test group test or something like so that? Many, uh, there's a lot of friction with iOS, right? Yeah. Yep. So that's, that's one of the big reasons I just wanted to have it so we can download it in one step. Yeah, so I mean, we, we, like, I've worked with people who've waited kind of years to put their app in the store. Yeah. And I, I don't think they learned much through that process, right? So uh, unfortunately, right, like I think they spent a lot of money. I think they spent a lot of time and the results were pretty similar, yeah. right? Because they iterated and built. Now there's, there's rare examples like Mailbox, right? Mailbox, they had actually one other app, the Notes app. I don't know if many people know that, but they did have another app that they learned a lot from and then they did Mailbox. Mailbox is probably the best example of a one-shot success in the App Store. Most folks test it. I mean, in, even Instagram, if you see the early shots of Instagram, it's a completely different product, yeah. right, and product experience, and they, dev they changed it and improved on it. What we, what we always recommend it, um, is just get it out there, and I think then you've got to look at tools to get traffic into it and try and find those users and buy in, but that's a good discipline to learn as well, because it, especially if it's your business, right, that's kind of your core business, <laughs> right? So the longer you delay doing your core business, a lot of people think when it's launched, like they can relax, right? It's complete opposite, right? When you launch, that's when the work starts. That's when you actually have to get users to it. That's where you have to tell people. That's where you have to do marketing. So you have to decide what, whether you built it was actually worth it. So the, the shorter path to learning that you maybe have built the wrong, wrong product is the best path, in my view, right? I think the tricky thing is to get those people. A lot of people put the app in the store and they'll get 10 downloads. Right? Um, there's a lot of hints and tricks of how you can improve that. Improving screenshots, improving the description, um, you know, changing um, you know, what you've got in 
not only the real features, but listed features. You can actually do quite a lot with, with playing with that and the App Store mechanics to drive up. And I would try buying, uh, I wouldn't buy installs from an ad network, right? I would try and you know, use as many tactics. I would use things like Facebook ads, and um, I would work with the product we're building um, to enable to buy, um, you know, buy active users. Like one, just to digress slightly, is one of the risks in buying an install is you're not buying a user who's interested in your product, right? The good news is, on, certainly on the ad tech side, we're very close to being able to really target an active user, right? And being able to give you tools to help re-engage, and Facebook's already launched their re-engagement ads, um, but also kind of keep engaging an active user. Um, and I think that's the kind of main product you'll see on the ad side, and I think that's going to help you with what you're doing. Um, but initially, you've got to, I would try it, or at least give it to everyone here and get their feedback. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Two. Uh, I've thought about using an offshore development team to create a prototype because it's so much cheaper. Any tips or advice? Or are you against using offshore? No, I'm not against using it at all. But what don't never talk to them and you know like ideally if you're not technical yourself get someone who is to ma help manage them right and work with them closely and and know what you're building and how you're building it i mean we learned a lot just from you know we did some we did a lot of customer development on top of the platform and we learned you know a lot from ourselves in just kind of where the gaps were when people just assumed we were doing stuff that we weren't <laughs> Um, and, you know, there's some great developers all over the world, like a bunch of, nearly all the companies in LA have some degree of, um, you know, offshore development going on, whether it's inside the company or outsourced. So, you know, whichever region of the world is fashionable right now and cheapest, um, I would, but I wouldn't use, you know, I wouldn't use price as a reason to do that, ideally, right? You know, there's no, my co-founder was fond of saying, you know, there's no, there's nothing interesting really about cheap development, right? I think it's useful, like I would use it to learn what you need to learn and I would think of ways with as little development as possible you could learn the maximum you could learn and then go build something at a decent, like as, as much quality as you, you can afford. Does that make sense? What's special about it? That's a good question. Uh, is there anything di different? Like some of the examples we described seem to be targeted at consumer-facing products. Now you work at AdTech now. Yeah. Um, is there anything different about it from product management? I think there's a lot different about it. I mean, there's a few people here. I think probably done both as well, and I, w I would ask them as well. My my personal view would be, it's like the 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 good thing about AdTech is, uh, and I've got to wrap up. Um, the good thing about ad tech is it's not optimized, right? Like, if, if you open your phone today, do you get a really good ad? Really? No, right? You get 320 by 50 banners, 80% of what we're second to Google at, at OpenX in the US in terms of number of ads served. Us and Google have 80% of mobile ads are 320 by 50 ads that aren't targeted, aren't relevant, right? And take up space on your product, <laughs> right? Then very few of them add any useful value. Now, the good news is that's changing. Right? And the good news is you as a developer can send signals and we built, we built our SDK, which I showed you in the video, in order to help do that. Um, so you've got to think, and you're only optimizing that very small space on the screen. Right? You're not optimizing consumer products. So having done the consumer product, that's frustrating sometimes. But at the same point, this, the ad business is so unoptimized. And you see, like I don't know if you're aware, but like Facebook in three quarters last year made 200 million revenue off install ads alone in launching that product, right? Um, and they really changed the advertising industry when they did that, and I, you know, I don't think that was as innovative as these things. I still see Clash of Clans, I see it in a different ad unit, but I still don't download Clash of, Clash of Clans, right? Um, so there's a lot more you can do to add, but I've discovered, I discovered Washio through um, Facebook ads, and I love that service, right? So I think, recommendations, services, different ad units, that's why we're doing native and we're pushing that and that's something I've been leading. You know, more immersive, more targeted ad units are going to be better. I think on the, you know, we're hiring, so if anyone's interested to learn more about ad tech, please come talk to me. Um, I think the challenges are, yeah, you don't own the whole experience and there's lots of legacy systems, there's lots of kind of issues with the old ways of, of doing, especially display ads on the web. 
um, that kind of add some challenges. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Really appreciate it.